we are here joined by Satyam Shahar, who is a principal architect and co-founder in NetSpring.io, uh, where he's working on databases. And this is what he will be talking about today. Uh, he has uh, 10 years of experience uh, in database space, so he uh, has a deep knowledge of all the internals. Satyam, to you. Uh, hey, Andre, thanks for the introduction. Hello, folks. My name is Satyam Shekhar, and I'm a co-founder at NetSpring, an operational intelligence startup that provides continuous analytics on real-time operational data. And today I'm here to talk about uh, code generation techniques in database engines for efficient query execution. All right, so let's take a quick look at the agenda. We'll begin with an intro to NetSpring and the technical challenges that we're tackling here. Then we'll go over a short primer on the details of SQL engine implementations. I know that the audience here is um, quite well versed with this topic, so I'll keep this section very brief. After that, we'll motivate the reasons for doing code generation and similar, similar techniques like vectorization by pointing out the shortcomings of traditional approaches. Uh, next, we'll dive into how we have architected our execution engine at NetSpring that draws ideas from the two well-established paradigms for operator evaluation, namely uh, code generation and vectorization. And finally, uh, we'll discuss the practical challenges of running a code generating engine in production system and techniques to overcome those challenges. All right, so let's begin with an intro to NetSpring. Uh, NetSpring provides a cloud platform as a service that allows its users to continuously uh, monitor, analyze, and alert on operational data. So operational data is uh, data that is produced by day-to-day -day operations of an organization. Things like every customer interaction with a product or every record for sales made on a website or at, or at retail, retail outlets fall in this category. This is the data that you go to if you want uh, the most up-to-date answers for your business questions. So, um, usually this operational data is massaged and ETL into data lakes and further clean and aggregated before being pushed to data warehouses for analytics. This process or the, or the pipeline to get data in, in the hands of the user takes time. Sometimes days and sometimes even weeks depending on the efficiency of the respective organization. The thing to realize is that the value of this operational data decays exponentially with time. As a business owner, I would like to know that my customers are unable to check out uh, items on my website due to a bug as soon as possible. So NetSpring's goal is to provide uh, the ability to analyze and alert on operational data as it is generated by transactional systems or on streaming event buses by allowing its users to query across rapidly uh, changing streaming data generated on messaging systems like Kafka and, at histori and historical data at rest on blob, blob stores like S3 with full joint support within milliseconds. Uh, to do, uh, to do this, uh, one of the core pieces of innovation in NetSpring's tech stack is its Converge Analytics platform, or CAP, that brings together the throughput and scale of modern data warehouses for interactive ad hoc querying, incremental compute capabilities from streaming platform for low latency monitoring and routing, and the ability to do uh, efficient event sequence computations from time series databases to perform complex path and funnel ana analysis for behavior uh, analytics. Usually there are specialized systems for each of these use cases. Since these use cases generate different query shapes and workload patterns that are complex to represent and evaluate in a, uh, in a single system, uh, CAP brings together these capabilities in one system by modeling the, all these, these queries as streaming data flows and employing and extending techniques from traditional query engines. Uh, the converged compute is built on top of a tiered streaming store engine, engine that provides seamless access to data to compute workers across blob stores like S3, local SSD and, and NVMe volumes and min memory. Uh, the, it, the storage engine provides the ability to incrementally scan ingested data to compute, to keep the compute proportional to changes for low latency monitoring and alerting uh, over rapidly changing data sets. The engine is uh, designed to ingest data at, at really high throughput and organize and index uh, the data in a, <coughs> sorry, in a manner that is uh, conducive for analytical query processing. And by bringing these capabilities together, 
CAP is able to obviate the need for data silos and complex architectures that are quite difficult to manage and maintain and also enable uh, queries that were not possible before due to data fragmentation. All right, so uh, uh, that should set some context on the type of problems that we're solving at NetSpring. Now, let us very quickly walk through basic steps of query execution in a standard uh, SQL engine. Uh, on a high level, uh, a SQL engine is a machine that takes SQL string as input and returns tabular data as output. The input SQL is a declarative spec of the calculation that a user intends to perform on their data. The engine takes that spec and parses it to create an uh, abstract syntax tree of SQL nodes based on the dialect. dialect. As part of this step, the input string is uh, validated to ensure it's syntactically correct and it conforms to the supported grammar. Uh, the syntax tree is uh, then converted to a more transformation-friendly tree of relational operators. So the, the this relational plan or the tree of operators is accurate in that it will uh, yield correct results if it were to be executed, but most likely it will run very slow because it's not optimized yet. And that's the next step. The uh, optimizer, the query optimizer, runs a series of cost-based and rule-based transformation on the naive plan to create an optimized plan. The optimized plan has, um, has correct join order, minimizes data flow, flowing through the query tree, uses appropriate data structures based on metadata stats and et cetera. Uh, the optimized plan is then used to create a set of imperative steps to be executed on the data distributed across the cluster to uh, compute the final result. The, the physical plan is used to instantiate physical operators on compute nodes in stages to read data from different sources, exchange data amongst themselves, uh, and finally compute the, the result and return the result to the client. So each of this, each of the steps in this process is very detailed and can be talked about independently, but our focus today will be on the most efficient way to execute physical operators on a single node. Uh, so let's talk about the basics of how operator uh, evaluation actually happens uh, inside query engines. Most traditional databases are uh, based on the seminal paper, Volcano paper that came out in uh, 1994. One of the core contributions of the, that paper was the iterator interface that decoupled query processing operators from the underlying data model. So it proposed that SQL operators like aggregation, um, join, et cetera, be encoded as iterators with uh, open next and close methods with each operator working on a stream of data uh, irrespective of its source. So an operator does not need to know that the source, uh, source of its input, whether it's uh, it's uh, a complex query subtree or a simple file scan. The uh, This model allows combining uh, any number, any kind of operators to execute an arbitrarily complex query. So let us uh, take a concrete example to better visualize the, the iterator interface. The query on the slide needs to find the total revenue for customers in San Francisco. So we have uh, two iterators in red. Uh, these, these iterators scan the transaction and customer tables respectively. There is a filter iterator in light blue that drops all rows where customer is not in San Francisco. The result of that, uh, uh, of that filter is joined with the transaction table to eliminate all non-San Francisco rows from the transaction table. And finally, the revenue is aggregated to produce total revenue. <laughs> On the right-hand side, we have uh, the iterator interface that encapsulates each of these relational operators. So iterators interact with each other through these open, next, and close methods to read input and produce output. The parent operator will recursively initialize this child by calling um, open on its children. Uh, then the result of the query will be obtained by calling next on the topmost iterator until the end of stream in indicator is seen uh, by the query driver. The each of each operator recursively call, calls next on its child to read data and then do the processing and forward the 
the result to its parent. And finally, Closer recursively called on all iterators to release allocated resources. Uh, like all beautiful interfaces, it's very concise, extremely in, uh, extensible, and encapsulates a lot of complexity in the implementation. So hopefully all of this makes sense. Now let's answer the question, why do we need to generate code? What's, uh, what's wrong with, uh, uh, what's missing with uh, the, in the interface that we just looked at? So actually before that, let's uh, be, uh, a lot of, uh, the, one of the reasons why the architecture has shifted, the, why we need newer, uh, uh, newer ideas to, uh, to optimize the interface that we just looked at is that uh, a lot has changed in computer architecture in the last 15 years, 10 to 15 years, that has enabled new fronts of optimizations to make query engines more performant. Whenever we're talking about uh, uh, performance optimizations, we're talking about bottlenecks. And uh, uh, traditionally, databases used to be bottlenecked on disk IO due to um, low read throughput and high seek latency. So the focus for database engineers at that time uh, used to be <coughs> minimizing volume of data read for a query and the number of seeks required to read that data. Three things have changed that, uh, that have obviated this bottleneck. Firstly, um, memory is a lot cheaper than what it used to be 10 to 15 years ago. The dollar price per MB for memory is uh, about uh, one tenth or one fifteenth of what it used to be in 2005 and 2006. Now we have uh, beefier machines that can cache a lot more data in main memory for serving queries. Uh, secondly, the advent of uh, NVMe devices in the last decade or so has really beefed up the pipe between disk and CPU and brought, brought down the latency to move data on disk to CPU registers. Uh, the disk throughput used to be in hundreds of MBs per second per disk for rotating hard drives. It is now um, catapulted to tens of GBs per second per disk. And the seek times have dropped from uh, uh, 30 to 50 milliseconds to 20, 30 microseconds. And finally, the elasticity of cloud has enabled on-demand scaling of aggregate disk bandwidth to, to reach and cross memory bandwidth for data to reach CPU registers. So memory bandwidth is somewhere around 40 to 50 uh, gigabytes uh, per second per socket. And systems today can reach that bandwidth by spinning up uh, 10 or so NVMe disks. So a lot of improvements have just uh, come with uh, hardware upgrade over the years, but these advances have pushed the bottlenecks to the CPU. The focus is now, now shifted from uh, optimizing disk read bandwidth and, uh, and seek times to minimizing uh, CPU instructions and better utilization of mem CPU and memory bandwidth. So with that mindset, let's take a look at uh, uh, the Volcano interface and crit critique it from the perspective of uh, optimizing per performance when the data is mostly in memory. So the change in mindset is that uh, most of the processing is happening, data residing in main memory. And this interface has to process uh, billions and trillions of aggregated rows uh, that is flowing through this interface. And the slightest of, of overhead imposed by this interface will have a drastic impact on query performance. So there are two problems with this interface. The first one is uh, the overhead of virtual function and dynamic dispatch. And the second problem is the usage of uh, union types to read data by the next call. Let us talk about each of these uh, problems. So dynamic dispatch, the flexibility offered by dynamic dispatch of virtual function that allowed us to decouple data from operator implementations comes at a cost. Uh, as most of you know, uh, Dynamic dispatch requires some indirection to enable uh, runtime polymorphism. Some languages achieve this via some sort of a V table or virtual function table. The side effect of the V table is that uh, besides adding an extra memory indirection uh, for every row passing through this interface, virtualized functions cannot be inlined by the compiler. Since the concrete instance of that method that will get invoked is not known until runtime. So the compiler misses out on a lot of opportunities 
a uh, lot of optimization opportunities since the code cannot be inline so and the program runs slower next the usage of uh, union type is quite costly as well since the interface needs to handle uh, uh, all shapes of output the row structure is built on top of a union structure that includes all output types compared to native types this structure has uh, at least eight more eight extra bytes and also requires branching based on the data type of the value uh, the eight extra bytes decrease performance due to an increase in the working set size and the per row branching causes a uh, branch uh, misprediction leading to poor performance so to illustrate the cost of the interface we have two c++ programs on the side here on the left hand side we have an extremely simplified version of the program that um, the database would execute using the iterator interface for a simple sum revenue query and on the right hand side we have um, uh, we have code for the same query if uh, written by a, a novice programmer to um, to evaluate some revenue the program on the right is uh, as you can see very simple uh, and also 100x faster than the program on the left so if there are any questions under here i would uh, uh, look to take questions here before we move on to more details no there are no questions so far you can go ahead all right so there are two well studied paradigms for operator evaluation to overcome the cost of iterator abstraction the first one is um, uh, vectorized execution model employed by systems like vectorize and snowflake in this model tuples pass through the the interface in batches to amortize the cost of uh, dynamic dispatch per row and um, that's, that these batches are usually sized in the order of uh, 1000 rows or more to minimize the cost of branching and uh, dynamic dispatch on top of that uh, operators and, ex and expressions are implemented by composing primitives that work on a single data type and this uh, this constraint uh, is allows uh, the imp the database implementation to eliminate uh, eliminate branching for type handling so for example uh, such an engine will have methods to compute some of an integer column and uh, a different method that sums up a double column and and dispatching is done once per batch of rows to these type specific uh, uh, implementations of for some adding doubles integers and hashing these uh, these column values uh, there is a, there is a paper everything that you everything you always wanted to know about uh, compiled and vectorized queries but were uh, afraid to ask in this paper the uh, they, the authors have demonstrated that um, <coughs> vectorized model is better at hiding cache miss latency than coordinated more coordinated tuple at a time model uh, and the other advantage of the vectorized model is that it is very well suited for simd operations since all its core compute primitives are built on uh, to work on uh, a batch of values on the other hand working with the constraint that compute primitives are uh, specialized for one type requires algorithms uh, the relational algorithms to be broken down into uh, type specific operations which can Uh, make the implementation non-intuitive. So, for example, ordering operator requires multiple rounds of sort for every sort key, using the type-specific function for uh, for 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 the sort key. And these implementations tend to get convoluted um, uh, and require extra CPU instructions have to to do the amount of work that you would expect to be done. Uh, much in a much compact manner had you written the code by hand and that's the uh, the intuition behind code generation uh, the engine a code generating engine uh, generates specialized code for every query and the generated code uh, is specialized on data types used in the query and removes the usage of virtual functions to eliminate interpret interpretation overhead the generated code is uh, compiled using an an embedded compiler uh, to machine code and then that generated uh, machine code is executed to compute results hyper um, 
uh, BB pioneered pioneered this architecture, and since then it has been adopted by many systems, including Spark, MemSQL, etc. Uh, generated code tries to uh, approximate the best possible program that a human software developer would have implement, implemented given the task to run only that query. And uh, by definition, such a such a implementation is uh, uh, is minimalistic and requires much fewer instructions to run the query and making it uh, so so it generated code engines which generate code run extremely fast on um, cache resident workloads because you have much fewer instructions that you need to execute your uh, uh, data your uh, you don't have any branching in your code, no if conditions, no uh, no type specific specific dispatching. However, the biggest drawback of the code generated approach is a compilation overhead that can add hundreds of milliseconds or even even multiple seconds at, at uh, times when the system is under heavy load. Uh, and the another challenge with the uh, generated uh, code is that. Uh, uh, it's quite hard to debug because when you're generating code uh, at runtime, you don't have uh, uh, debug symbols that are you required for uh, efficient debugging, efficient developer, exp developer experience. So with that background, uh, let's now look at how we do operator evaluation in NetSpring's query engine. Uh, NetSpring's execution engine is push-based. It generates code. On, uh, on a vectorized interface. Let's deconstruct each of these points. Uh, so uh, an operator in NetSpring is equivalent of, um, of iterator interfacing Volcano. Uh, and the when we say push based, what we mean is uh, unlike the Volcano interface where the parent operator uh, was pulling data from its children using the next method, data is pushed from the child operator to, to their parents. And uh, the this push-based model has multiple benefits for NetSpring. Firstly, it uh, allows uh, modeling execution plans as uh, directed acyclic graphs, DAGs instead of uh, instead of trees, to eliminate multiple scans of data. And uh, secondly, uh, it also enables natural modeling for streaming queries uh, that require low end-to-end -end latencies. So as soon as you there is data available at uh, at the leaf of uh, leaf operators. The data is pushed to its parent whenever it becomes available, as the data is being being loaded into the system in the storage engine. And then we have vectorized interface. Data is uh, the the operator interface in NetSpring has uh, uh, pushes data in batches across these operators. The, uh, this model allows us to keep operators independent of each other, even in generated code, without paying the cost of abstraction. So similar to the trade model, uh, similar to the uh, vectorized model, where uh, the data is pushed in batches, we retain, the, we retain that property. We have a packet interface, the, a packet uh, object that is essentially a collection of, uh, of, uh, of collection of values per column. And that uh, that packet is the unit of uh, data transfer between operators. And then finally, we the this interface, the implementation of this interface, optimize the implementation uh, of consume and produce methods by generating and compiling code. So the generated C plus the NetSpring generates C plus plus code, uh, which is compiled and optimized to native machine instructions using. Uh, uh, LLVM internally uh, the the con the implementation of these operator in, uh, interface for respective uh, relational operators they they'll forward the consume and produce methods uh, to to the function pointer obtained by compiling generated code. So, uh, however, there is uh, one difference then in this inter in this in the in the, inter the, in the way NetSpring generates code uh, from um, Hyper or, or Spark, that operators are not generated code is not fused in NetSpring. So instead of each operator uh, 
instead of generating one large monolithic code for uh, that entire operator tree, each operator internally generates C++, uh, generates C++ code, uh, which is compiled independently and, uh, and processed within the operator interface boundary. So this, uh, the other, uh, uh, the, the operators generate code and compile code. However, they're not required to do so by, by um, for all the relation operator implementation. For example, limit operator and uh, union on operator uh, does not generate code. Instead, they provide an inter interpreted implementation that are equally efficient. So we have the flexibility of switching between the, the between, uh, uh, generated code model or vect uh, vectorized model based on the requirements of, of the operator implementation. So if I were to place uh, well-known engines on this 2D matrix, systems like Snowflake and Vectorize uh, are vectorized engines and they do interpreted evaluation since they fall in the second quadrant. The uh, <laughs> Vectorize is a pull-based uh, system and Snowflake pushes data from uh, leaf to the root of the query tree. Uh, Yellow boxes here are pull based and green boxes are push based engines. The uh, Hyper and Spark generate code and do two at a time processing. Uh, hence, they fall in the fourth quadrant. Both of these systems are push based systems, but there are some systems like um, Hecaton that uses pull based two at a time execution model with compiled uh, processing. So you, you can design a system and uh, put, you can pick each of these. Uh, uh, this, pick each of these attributes based on requirements. And like we discussed, uh, the NetSpin execution model uh, uses vectorized interface, generates code, um, and uh, uh, uses push-based execution model. So it's on the first quadrant here. The third quadrant is mostly obsolete. Uh, uh, the systems there are not uh, production systems now. So now let's talk about the advantages of this model. In this model, we get benefits of vectorization with simplicity of, uh, of uh, code generation. So the packet-based interface in generated code unlocks all optimization that generally come with vectorization along with the simplicity of algorithm found in code generating engines. So uh, uh, this, uh, Uh, generated code, the code that we generate in, in NetSpring contains simple short loops that looks uh, similar to vectorized engines, uh, specialized for the query in hand. So when I say uh, specialized for query in hand, what I mean, what I'm trying to mean is that the branching and uh, dynamic dispatch is uh, all removed. The short, the memory access patterns that are uh, uh, that memory access patterns of vectorized engine that enable uh, uh, better memory prefetching. That was uh, that was the paper that I was talking about earlier. Uh, you could, since we are operating on that interface, we are able to replicate that memory access pattern in our uh, in our operator implementation. So we get uh, we enable the compiler to uh, to do to. Uh, to optimize, we make things easier for the compiler to optimize. So a loop unrolling, auto vectorization, these things are easier to uh, get kicked in. And the memory access pattern of vectorized engines aids the CPU to make better prefetching decisions. The second advantage is um, faster compilations. So compile time is super linear with respect to code size. So unlike Spark and Hyper, that generate uh, uh, fused operate fused code for all operators in a query tree netspring generates small uh, code fragments one per operator for a sql query and uh, since the compile time is super linear with respect to code size the compiling smaller fragments independently leads to faster compilation time even if the number of lines of code that you're compiling is the same total number of uh, code that you're compiling is uh, is same. The third advantage of this model <laughs> is that minor changes to the query do not lead to the compilation of uh, recompilation of the entire query. Instead, only operators that have changed are compiled again. Uh, for example, changing sort order 
uh, does not recompile the aggregate operator. Only the code generated for the sort operator is recompiled. And uh, so this means, and since we have, um, uh, since you, we can cache uh, these, we can cache compiled modules on against the generated code, the uh, changes to one operator does not, uh, does not affect the cache hit for remaining operators that are still generating the same code. So for example, we observed, um, we ran uh, TPCDS query set on, uh, on a code cluster that had no queries run on it or on it yet. And we observed 75% compiled caches for code generated by operators, by code generated by operators when uh, for TPCDS queries. So this was a completely code cluster. If you were to do this on other uh, engine that, other engines that generate use code, every single query would have had a compiled cache miss. Compared, uh, compared to NetSpring engine that hit 70 that hit almost uh, hit compile cache for almost 75 percent uh, uh, of the times so 75 percent for all uh, uh, operators generated by the query by the entire tpc test, test suite then uh, the next uh, advantage is trading off uh, this design against uh, um, vectorized engines Vectorized engines, since they have to work with the constraints that uh, compute primitives need to be specialized for one type, they are uh, they require algorithms to be broken down into these type-specific uh, uh, operations, which can make the implementation on intuitive. So, uh, you know, on the slide here, we have uh, an implementation of a of a grouping operator. On the left hand side is the code that you would expect to um, that you would expect to write by hand and this is the code that's generated by a code generating engine on the right hand side here we have uh, the code uh, for aggregating data in a vectorized uh, engine and if you notice uh, like just evident by the number of lines of code on the slide the the two implementation implementations are quite different the implementation on the right hand side is quite complex and uh, it has to handle has to specially handle uh, scenarios when uh, new when you are inserting new grouping keys in the in the hash map to ensure that you're not inserting duplicates in the hash table. So if a packet has multiple uh, multiple instances of same grouping key, you have to take extra care uh, that in the in the vectorized operation you don't end up inserting the same key twice, which is not even a problem in in um, on the in the code on the left hand side because you are you are uh, uh, iterating through each row one by one. Similarly, the ordering operator requires multiple rounds of sort for every sort key using a, the type specific uh, function for the sort key. So the the this implement the, these implementations the vectorized algorithms on uh, are uh, require a lot more CPU instructions that can uh, that can make the, that has the potential for speed up. The other advantage of this, uh, this interface is maintaining uh, operator boundary using, uh, during query execution enables collecting precise operator level metrics without interference from other operators. Uh, vectorized interface uh, aids such instrument instrumentation since metrics can be collected at uh, operator interfaces, operator boundaries, and uh, since the unit of exchange is, is a batch of rows, the overhead of, uh, of collecting these metrics is also minimum. Uh, this, this, the advantage here is trading off against uh, 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 a code generating engine. This is advantage is same uh, for, like, for all vectorized engines. And this is another sample for uh, of the, the, the uh, The, the sample for the metrics that we are able to collect at query runtime uh, for uh, physical operators instantiated in a distributed query. So every operator, every instance of a physical operator in the distributed cluster, uh, we are able to collect these metrics and uh, and inspect for debugging, etc. All right. So now let's uh, talk about the uh, the 
challenges that you that you run into when you're generating code at runtime. So the three main challenges when generating code. The first one is compilation cost. The second is debugging difficulties, and uh, the final problem is profiling pains. <coughs> Let's start with compilation cost. So to minimize the cost of compilation uh, at NetSpring, we cache the compiled and optimized LLVM modules against uh, the generated CPP code. Uh, physical operators like uh, are all share a common instance. So uh, whenever we uh, uh, get a query, the query is uh, is translated to a physical plan, and that physical plan contains instantiate physical operators that share uh, this same instant, instance of compiled cache. So during uh, execution, the uh, generated C++ C++ code is used to look up pre-compiled LLVM modules in uh, in compiled cache. On cache miss, the CPP code is uh, is compiled to native instructions and uh, saved for com in, com in the compiled cache for future use. On cache hit, the compiled the module is retrieved from compiled cache and uh, then loaded into memory and then executed. So one thing to call out is that uh, the compile setup is such that it compiles um, identical code just once, even in case of parallel compilation across different queries. So the next thing that we do is uh, LLVM provides the ability to serialize uh, uh, compiled modules to string. So we have uh, uh, we have a disk-based compile cache um, that essentially um, uh, makes the size of the compile cache to infinite and uh, unlike the uh, unlike the memory cache that does not that get that that's lost on uh, process restarts the disk based compile cache uh, survives restart the uh, other technique to minimize the cost of compilation is to parameterize constant in generated code. So the, the generated code does not contain references to uh, uh, constants present in the query. Instead, the code has references to uh, uninitialized variable during compile time. And after the code is compiled, variable references are bound to the query constant using uh, the JIT operator construction. So this ensures that uh, identical queries with different constants uh, hit compile cache. So an example of that would be, let's say you change the query, uh, some revenue where revenue is greater than 10 to some revenue uh, where revenue is greater than 20. If uh, the, since we've parameterized the constant here is 10, if since we have parameterized 10 as a constant in the query, the uh, generated code would look identical and it would hit compile cache. And uh, then, uh, uh, the other technique that we use is to uh, uh, we pre-compile parts of our JIT runtime into the host binary and resolve the uh, uh, these resolve these pre-compiled symbols uh, uh, during module the compiled module link time. So this since now push pre-compiling uh, pre-compiling the JIT runtime uh, significantly reduces the amount of code that needs to be compiled per operator and uh, speeds up compilation process. So uh, now let's talk about the other set of challenges, debugging and profiling. Uh, debugging and profiling is hard in this world because uh, we don't have symbols for generated code. So when you're generating code and, uh, uh, and compiling it on the fly, the symbol table that's built into the binary uh, for you, built into your binary by the compiler, is not present for uh, uh, for uh, the tools that that you usually use to debug and profile uh, 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 your performance uh, issues or uh, some crashes. So what LLVM provides is this thing called JIT Event Listener interface to notify clients about significant events during compilation. So this interface is uh, used by compilers and debuggers to track memory. Uh, uh, address changes where the functions have been emitted. So once when you compile the the compiled uh, code gets loaded into some 
uh, location in memory and that addresses and the, the LNVM infrastructure provides you notifications on on uh, which symbol is located at what memory address. So we have a custom implementation of the uh, event listener that builds a symbol table in the process memory uh, for loaded compiled LNVM module. And this uh, this symbol table enables debugging and both debug debugging and profiling. I'll get uh, uh, into more details for both debugging and profiling. The the one thing that we that to call out is that symbol table is is pruned as uh, uh, as compiled modules get unloaded from memory like once they're evicted from from compiled cache, and the, there is no query using that compiled module to keep the size of the, the symbol table uh, uh, constrained. So now that we have a symbol table, symbol table you can think of as a, as a map that takes in a um, uh, address and uh, returns the symbol for that address. Uh, we can use that symbol table to uh, generate stack traces that uh, generate symbolized stack traces even when the crash happens in the generated compiled code. To do that, there are two things that uh, that uh, you need to do. One is uh, <laughs> while generating code, you have to set uh, this. Uh, this uh, you have to instruct the compiler to include debug symbols in the in the output, and also set uh, frame pointer. So stack unwinding is a complex uh, uh, is has lots of nuances, and uh, setting frame pointer in the generated code allows your debugging tools to uh, easily walk the stack across host and generated code uh, generated code uh, uh, stack frames and then once we, have, we do that we add uh, uh, add a hook into glog or like whichever library that you use appseal glog poly uh, for uh, uh, crash handling we add a crash handler to symbolize the stack traces using the custom given jit event listener uh, that we have that contains uh, the uh, symbol table then uh, the other thing that so this comes uh, G, the GDB JIT event listener comes free with uh, uh, with LLVM so uh, it's provided by LLVM and uh, turning it on allows you to uh, to connect GDB with your uh, to connect GDB to your running program and also resolve uh, symbols within the within the generated code so you on the example here shows that uh, uh, that the 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 symbols in the red box here they are generated in inside jit codes they you know by JIT, the jit code dot cpp method and uh, it has uh, it has uh, symbols in the generated code and uh, so you can use this for debugging issues when you have uh, uh, when when you want to debug some uh, some issue that's like a difficult issue when you want to attach GTB, usually you you don't have that flexibility in in generated code but uh, recent advancements in LLVM has uh, provides you the ability to you know, to attach GDB to generated code as well and then uh, the other thing that we do is uh, is we Symbolize GPerf profile. So, uh, for folks who are familiar with GPerf, uh, not familiar with GPerf, you, you can use GPerf to profile the uh, the uh, a program that you're trying to optimize. So, but usually when you profile uh, using GPerf, the output is not symbolized. And so, if you extract that output and you try to symbolize it, symbolize that uh, that output using symbols. In the host binary, you will have not have symbols for the uh, the generated code. So what we do is uh, uh, generates profiles, generate symbolized profiles within the host binary with uh, using the JIT event listener. And uh, the, there is this uh, the the GPerf library has um, uh, has a description of the format for symbolized profile. So we we use that format and. Uh, uh, Essentially, appending all the all the symbols used in the profile at the end of the uh, uh, profile output, and we uh, every profiling request profiles the uh, the binary while the uh, an, while an expensive query is running, and then uh, uh, we symbolize that profile within the host binary uh, 
using the JT event listener and return that output to the user uh, for uh, debugging. So as you can see here, the box is in red here. The these operators that consume most of the time they are inside the uh, generated code. And <laughs> the other thing that usually folks want to do when they're optimizing performance is to to uh, look at perf output, the Linux perf output to see, uh, uh, to understand where exactly, where precisely uh, time is being spent. So LLVM also provides this perf data event listener like the GDB data event listener that uh, uh, allows uh, uh, perf to communicate with JIT, JIT symbols. So we turn on both, uh, uh, we have the ability to turn on both Perf JIT event listener and uh, DDB JIT event listener dynamically uh, uh, for for our running binary and then uh, attach GDB or run Perf. So that uh, concludes my my talk. The in summary, the what, what the things that uh, I would like to for everyone to take away are. Uh, Abstractions while powerful, they have associated costs. So we saw the iterator interface had uh, looked, uh, uh, look had gave us so much flexibility uh, of representing arbitrary complex queries by composing um, these iterators. But they added the significant, they have significant impact on query performance. And then the next thing uh, uh, to call out is that Code generation on vectorized interfaces brings both best of both the vectorized uh, uh, world and the um, code generation uh, and and the advantages of code generation. And while uh, finally the while debugging JIT code uh, is may seem daunting to begin with, it can be configured to provide uh, uh, native developer experience with with relatively small effort. All right, thanks, folks. Thank you, Satya. Thank you for the talk. Uh, we don't have any questions right now, but I think uh, there might be some uh, people joining in uh, Zoom for the Q and A. So please join. Ask your questions. We're gonna we can go deep on any details, and Satya will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you once again, Satya. Thanks, Andre.